All right. My name is researcher Ro Lucian, and today I'm going to be talking about SCP-2094. Item number, SCP-2094. Object class, Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-2094 is contained in a medium security residential chamber in Biosite 59. Standard PG-class pre-approved luxuries and amenities may be granted on a supervised basis as an incentive to promote cooperation in interviews and experiments. Psychotropic maintenance of SCP-2094's emotional health is presently overseen by Dr. Aniston. ES number 59-390-258 Any request to access or alter SCP-2094's current drug regimen must be submitted to her in triplicate for review. Description SCP-2094 is a human male of European descent. 38 years old as of April 10th, 2014. Several tattoos depicting common circus motifs are present on SCP-2094's upper body. SCP-2094 communicates in American English, specifically the New York City English dialect. SCP-2094 possesses exceptional, non-anomalous manual dexterity, with particular proficiency in juggling. SCP-2094 is a subject of a spatial anomaly originating within its oral cavity. SCP-2094's lower jaw and facial muscles can be pulled and stretched up to 2 meters in any direction without causing any considerable pain or injury. Additionally, SCP-2094 is capable of redirecting any physical matter that enters its mouth into an extra-dimensional organ made of anomalously elastic intestinal tissue. There appears to be no limit to the amount of matter that SCP-2094 can store inside this space. The weight of objects carried inside the pocket has no effect on SCP-2094's overall weight, and neither causes SCP-2094 discomfort nor impairs its mobility. SCP-2094 refers to this space as its second stomach. However, research indicates that it serves no actual biological purpose. SCP-2094 was recovered in an open field near Kamiferno, Japan along with an assortment of non-anomalous artifacts related to GOI-233, Herman for the Circus of the Disquieting. SCP-2094 was discovered bound in chains and locked inside a large antique trunk bearing the words for Essay, written on the top panel in red paint. Recovered Belongings The following items were removed from SCP-2094's intestinal space during preliminary containments. Wooden juggling clubs of various colors. Metal lighter and several packages of cigars. 120 button bass accordion. Suitcase containing two sets of clean clothes, a toothbrush, and a shaving kit. Fully functional 1962 Maserati 3500 coupe with minor interior and mechanical modifications. Burlap sack containing a number of antique wind-up toys. Operational submachine gun. An accompanying ammunition. Circa 1959. Fire breathing torch. Plastic trunk containing 45 bottles of kerosene. Selected interview number one. Interviewer, Dr. O'Sullivan. Interviewee, SCP-2094. Notes. Interview conducted February 24th, 2006. The day after SCP-2094 entered containment. Begin log. Congratulations, sir. It appears you've snagged yourself a front row seat to the freak show. Lucky you. Room's a bit too clean for my taste, but hey, it's the performer that makes the stage. At least that's what old Gordy used to say. Why, doctor! We haven't even introduced ourselves, and you're already putting up walls between us. This does not bode well for our relationship. Good evening, SCP-2094. My name is Dr. O'Sullivan. I'll be- O'Sullivan, you say? Faith in Pagora? Well, I'll be a shamrock shantyman. I'm a wee bit Irish too, on me mom's side. I'll be conducting the interview this afternoon. An interview, you say? Gee, I've never been interviewed before. Oh, this should be fun. Does this mean I'm famous? Is this the loony bin where all the superstars eventually end up? Hey, any chance you got Andy Kaufman stashed away somewhere? I am not at liberty to discuss the nature of this facility. 
Come on now, it's obvious what this place is. You guys haven't been particularly subtle about it. The armed guards, the reinforced cells, the constant observation, the delicate crystal barrier keeping me from caressing that gorgeous face of yours. Where was I? Oh, yeah. Any old dog could figure out what kind of place this is. We're at Knott's Berry Farm. Obviously. When are you guys finally going to face facts? You're never going to be as good as Disneyland. Not ever. No matter how many special snowflakes like me you try to recruit. You seem to be in a talkative mood. Why don't you tell me about the Circus of the Disquieting? Oh, it's a grand place, grand place, lovely people you should go sometime. Bring the family, make a day of it. I'd very much like to see it in person. How would I go about finding it? Doctor, 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 you don't find the circus. The circus finds you. See, you're trudged through life, trawling through the muck of your mundane existence, drowning in pencil shavings and choking on the sterile fumes of your tidy little office, until one day you realize the stale taste of paper and politics in your soul has become so overwhelming that even the most stringent of fluorides can't scrub it away. Then, just when you started to feel like there's nothing left on this crummy planet that can make your life worth living, that's when you start to see the balloons. The lights, the clowns, all of it there to remind you that there's still some magic left in the world. Yes, I imagine that's how you would go about finding the circus, Mr. Sullivan. Do you know an individual at the circus with an upside-down face? Ah, so you know about Manny. Wait, what am I saying? Of course you know about Manny. You guys probably know everything from his childhood sweetheart to his shoe size. He's a pretty memorable fella, stand-up guy, good with kids, excellent performer, diligent leader, detail-oriented, task-specific, synergy-efficient, low-hanging fruit, viable asset leverage. Feel free to stop me whenever you like, Sully. What role does he play at the circus? Ophelia, occasionally. And I always cry. But he's usually off doing his own thing. He's a very busy, upside-down-faced man. Does a lot of important, upside-down-faced man things. He sounds like an interesting person. When did you meet him? Nah, you don't want to hear about all that. Wouldn't you rather hear my impression of Jane Fonda? Pygar, why did you save her after all the terrible things she did to you? There, that was pretty good, wasn't it? I can also do a decent Aubrey Hepburn, and my Helen Keller isn't too bad either. Please, don't be afraid to share your experiences at the circus. I understand many of the freaks were kidnapped and abused from a young age, but you're very far from your captors now. They can't hurt you here. Kidnapped? Abused? Who all have you been talking to? Listen, if I've been less than cooperative with you, it's not because I'm traumatized. You can put that out of your mind right now. It's cause I'm not the type to sell my circus family out to the white coats. I know you're a game, Essie. You want to get all buddy-buddy with me and milk me for all I'm worth. Well, tell your boys to scribble this down on their clipboards. These people you've been hounding, these men and women you've been hunting down like criminals, they're saints. You hear me? They're good folks. I wasn't kidnapped, you dingbat. I ran away, and they took me in with open arms. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to insult your family. What's this? Some slight semblance of sensitivity? Have I begun to warm my way into your cold, crusty lump of a heart, Doctor? Tell me, why did you run off? And there it went. So we're playing the backstory game now, eh? Sure, I'll bite. I was eight years old. My dad hit the road long before I was born, so I lived at home with dear old mom. A real gem of a woman, my mother. She lived an enchanted life, sitting upon her mommy throne and drinking her special mommy water until her eyes rolled back in her head. She never hit me or anything, but she hated me. God, she hated me. And the feeling was mutual. Sometimes I would bring home a mouthful of woodland creatures just because it drove her nuts. <laughs> I'd walk up to her all innocent-like, smile one of those adorable eight-year-old smiles, and then spit up a couple dozen rats under her lap. So she was aware of your anomalous properties? What? You mean this? Yeah, she noticed. There's a good reason I wasn't breastfed. And because I was such an odd little thing, she kept me holed up inside the house pretty much all the time. Guess she was worried I'd eat somebody. Not once did it occur to me to bust out and hit the world on my own, though. Back in the day, I was a pretty timid kid, believe it or not. But then one night- actually, hold on. Uh, let me get back to that in a second. Have you ever seen Peter Pan? The animated one? I have. Okay, good. Uh, where was I? Oh, yeah. But then one night, when my mom was asleep, he came into my room. Showed up at my window, silhouetted against the stars just like Peter Pan. He told me that freaks didn't belong cooped up in boxes their whole lives. 
He told me they belonged out in the world, sharing their gifts, making people laugh and scream and puke. He told me of a place where I'd be loved by hundreds, where I'd be a star, where I'd have a real family. So I took his hand. Mommy Dearest was too deep in the drink to even notice us waltzing out the front door. And that, dear Sully, is how I wound up running away to join the circus. Best decision of my life. Being visited by a stranger in the middle of the night didn't alarm you as a child? Well, his face was upside down, so I suppose I should have been a little spooked. But at the time, I was just excited to meet someone who was even weirder than I was. And you weren't treated badly at the circus? I'll tell you right now, the circus life ain't for everyone. But hey, Manny and the gang did the best they could. They put bread in our mouths and pillows under our heads. I got a whooping now and again, but what kid doesn't? It's all part of growing up. Kept me in line and manned me up quickly. The folks at the circus loved me like I was one of their own. They never made me feel like being a freak was anything to be hidden or ashamed of. When you're part of a circus family, you look out for one another. You don't just turn around and sell your family out to the SAP Foundation. When the recovery team discovered you, you were locked in a trunk. You were left for us to find. Can you tell me why that is? Were there any problems between you and your family? Ha. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to know? Sorry, Sully, but I think I've done enough talking. You ain't getting nothing else out of me. Not now, not never. That's fine. Thank you for your time, SCP-2094. Hey, don't mention it. Anything for my number one fan. End log. Selected interview number two. Interviewer. Dr. O'Sullivan, Interviewee, SCP-2094, Notes, Interview conducted eight months after SCP-2094 entered containment. Begin Log, SCP-2094 is led into the interview chamber. Bless me Blarney Stones, it's old Doc Sullivan again. How have you been Doc? Because I've been great. Is that a fact? Of course not, you dingus. This place is a total shithole. What can I tell you, I'll run it anyhow. I knew I should have booked the Hilton. I'm sorry to hear that. Life in Biosite 59 might take some getting used to. Is there anything particular you're having trouble adjusting to? Well, since you asked, the food tastes like elephant guano, the bed's as hard as a rock, and the little red light on the camera keeps me up at night. Would it really kill you guys to stock the bathrooms with two-ply? Seriously, I've slept in prisons that were more hospitable than this place. You know, SCP-2094, if you can provide me with some additional information on the circus, I could put in a formal request for improvement. Oh, not that again. I'm not gonna dish, you hear me? You don't have to tell us anything that might compromise the safety of your family. We're not after sensitive information, necessarily. Just tell me about the circus, acts you've performed, friends you've made. Anything will work. Hmm. Anything, huh? Within reason, yes. And you'll give me junk if I just spin some simple yarns for you. That could be arranged, yes. Softer bed, better food, DVDs... Those sound like reasonable requests. Adult magazines, even? I... I'll see what I can do. You know what? Sure. Why the hell not? I've been itching to talk to somebody anyway. Where should I start? I think... Never mind, I know where. Okay, so picture this. Lush, green grass, wide open space, blue skies above. Imagine the most perfect day possible. Anomalously perfect, you might say. All of our days are like that. Never a rain cloud in sight. Now imagine, candy-striped tents, and musicians in brightly colored outfits, and balloon animals that prance through the air above you. And clowns that actually succeed at being funny. Picture, if you will, the most beautiful goddamn circus you've ever dreamt of, and then forget about it, because it's nothing compared to Herman Fuller's. Of course, it's not always what you'd call crowd-ready. Things can get a bit, uh, chaotic at times. Alright, full disclosure, it's a madhouse more often than not, but by golly, when the normies start rolling in, there's not a hair out of place. We can thank our ringmaster for that. She's phenomenal. In terms of leadership as, well, it's booty. Hello, Ness. She wasn't really around when I first arrived, though. The overall look and feel of the circus hasn't really changed since the turn of the century. 
The people, however, change quite a bit, as they are wont to do. Take me, for example. I think I mentioned before that I wasn't always the charming portrait of confidence I am today. In the early days, I was a tenderfooted little lad, recently departed from home, overwhelmed by the strange and wonderful world he'd been swept up into. I mostly just stood around staring in dumbstruck awe at everything around me, never really talking or nothing. I was a pretty wide-eyed kid, and an adorable one from what I hear. So, obviously, they gave me a job as a human clown car. I mean, really, what else could they do but send me on stage with a few dozen clowns waiting to lurch out of my guts? It wasn't the most glamorous job, but I did get some kicks out of it. <laughs> you should have seen the looks on the audience's faces when that marching band started parading out of my lips. Priceless. Let's see. After that, I learned some juggling from a guy named Scythe. Total doucheburger, but pretty handy with a pair of swords. I never got to handle them, of course, just balls and clubs and all that. Scythe was another story entirely. I mean, you could shove a shiv into every square inch of the guy's body and he wouldn't bat an eye. He was a real baby when it came to being set on fire, though, and ended up going up in smoke in the middle of a show. Total spoil sport dying like that. They held a service for him, but I was busy that day. After a while, I got more comfortable with the other folks. Started to assert myself. The clown shtick had to end. I mean, it was fun and all, but it didn't really mesh with my newfound sense of pride. So I did the juggling thing for a while, tossing random drunk around and then swallowing at the end. Pretty low-scale stuff, comparatively speaking. And I knew I'd end up getting relegated to the den of freaks if I didn't up my game. Don't get me wrong, there's a ton of great folks in the den, and it's not a bad place, but it's not the big time, you know? So when I got to be a horny teenager, I thought, why not devour a woman whole? At first, everyone thought it was going to be a step down from the clown thing, but then I came up with the idea to put a plant in the audience, call them up into the ring, and then swallow them in one gulp. It was alright, I guess, and nicely provocative, but the act didn't really take off until I got Theodore in on it. In addition to being able to turn himself inside out, Theo also had a knack for the gymnastic stuff, and we managed to make a high diving act out of it. He'd leap off a diving board, flip his innards out, and plop right into me. It was a hit, of course. Theo and I got a lot of attention after that, especially once we started dating. Turned out I found guys were just as fun to swallow as gals. The act got stale after a while though, and then when I broke it off with Theo, that put the final nail in its coffin. He went back to the den and I was going to be following pretty quick if I didn't think of something new to do. I thought and thought and brainstormed up a hurricane, but nothing would come to me. I needed a big ticket idea. Something that wouldn't just be a hit, but would earn me legendary status. And then one day, when I was dumping an especially long string of ideas on Quincy, he told me he'd barf a swarm of bees on my face if I didn't shut my motor mouth. And then it hit me. Motor mouth. I'd gotten pretty talkative at that point, so it was an appropriate enough title to take on, but the act that came with it was a stroke of genius, if I do say so myself. Picture this. Two lovely assistants on either side of me, they pull my mouth open good and wide, and then, all of a sudden, a Chrysler comes barreling into the big top, hits a ramp, and sails down my throat. Pretty fantastic, huh? You don't look impressed. Imagination's atrophied, eh? Well, just take my word for it when I say it was pretty damn nifty. Great spectacle value, and legitimately dangerous. I may be magic, but I doubt that even I'd survive a Porsche to the face if it were to miss. I got the legend status I was looking for, of course. Became one of the top build acts nearly overnight. Things were going swimmingly for me. And then I ended up here. Way to go for that. Ruining my life and all. At least I'll be remembered as a star. That's nice. This still sucks though, I gotta say. Now, how much stuff did that earn me? End log. Incident log number one. On December 7th, 2006, SCP-2094 was found in a state of extreme distress, to the point of self-harm. Biosite-59 caretakers were able to successfully restrain and sedate SCP-2094. The following is a transcript of statements made by SCP-2094 prior to the incidents. Begin log. SCP-2094 abruptly awakens from sleep. Stop it! SCP-2094 clutches the sides of its head and makes pained vocalizations. Please, there wasn't going to... Stop! SCP-2094 leaps from its bed and begins knocking its head violently against the wall. Don't... Take... Anything! 
SCP-2094 loses balance and falls to the floor. It screams. It's all I have now, Manny! It's all I have! End log. When SCP-2094 was taken out of its sedated state, it displayed symptoms of severe retrograde amnesia and episodic memory, specifically in memories related to his experience in GOI-233. Dr. O'Sullivan was issued an official reprimand for not using more immediate information extraction techniques before the incident took place, and resigned from his post as lead researcher for SCP-2094 on January 15, 2007. SCP-2094 entered a severely depressed psychological state following this incident. Dr. Anderson began psychotropic treatment of SCP-2094's condition on February 3, 2007. Dr. Anderson's Report Number 1 The following is a message sent from Dr. Anderson to Site Director Bluth on February 13, 2007. Hello. I'm writing to you today to inform you that SCP-2094 has undergone an extreme change in personality since I was first assigned to it early last year. Before, it was lively, energetic, and highly talkative, quick to engage in banter and turn a phrase. Speaking freely, it was one of the few patients I enjoyed speaking with, occasional lewd remarks notwithstanding. However, since the December incident, SCP-2094 has grown increasingly withdrawn. In addition to its depression, it has developed severe anxiety and appears to be in a constant state of terror at its surroundings. Its interpersonal skills have rapidly degenerated to the point of being visibly nervous around interviewers, even those permitted to address it by its given name for bonding purposes. SCP-2094 has also shown a marked decrease in its interest in physical activity, including juggling, which was a pastime in which it regularly engaged in with any object it could get its hands on. I know that your vision for Biosite 59 is one where anomalies are kept reasonably healthy and happy, and the success of your mental health treatment initiative continues to positively influence other humanoid containment facilities. However, I'm afraid that there's only so much that I can do at this point. Attempts to treat its depression have worsened its anxiety, and attempts to treat its anxiety has worsened its depression. I have consulted with my peers on this issue, and we agree that SCP-2094's unstable mental state puts riskier options out of the equation. We will continue to do our best to treat SCP-2094 medically and through counselling, but it seems unlikely that SCP-2094 will return to its previous disposition. Given your commitment to SCP quality of life, I know this will come as a disappointment to you especially after the letter you sent noting your fondness for its unconventional interview logs. I felt it was important for you to be aware of the situation, and given your background in the mental health field, I hope that you will not hesitate to offer any advice you may have concerning the situation. Dr. Miranda Aniston Incident Log Number 2 on March 11, 2007, SCP-2094 was found attempting to consume itself in what is presumed to be a suicide attempt. Biocide-59 caretakers were able to successfully restrain and sedate SCP-2094. Dr. Anderson approved paperwork placing SCP-2094 on Level 2 Suicide Watch on March 12, 2007. Dr. Anderson's Report Number 2 the following is a message sent from Dr. Anderson to Site Director Bluth on April 15, 2014. Hello. As you're aware, I have been in charge of overseeing SCP-2094's psychiatric treatment for the past eight years. During that time, it has shown minimal and inconsistent progress, continually resisting treatment and refusing to cooperate with me and my staff. However, over the past two months, I've observed a significant degree of improvement in SCP-2094's overall condition. It's beginning to open up about its thoughts and feelings for the first time in years, and has even requested juggling clubs, which it has been granted access to under supervision. SCP-2094 has yet to completely explain what led to its improvement in mood, but so far I've been able to gather that it has made peace with the past, forgiven and been forgiven in return and gotten back something valuable. Presumably, these statements have to do with it regaining some memories lost to its amnesia. 
Due to the comparatively high levels of cooperation SCP-2094 has shown recently, I am not pressing for further answers at this time, although more in-depth interviews are scheduled to be conducted. Yesterday afternoon, SCP-2094 submitted a formal request to hold a performance for the staff at Biosite 59. It is my personal recommendation that this request be granted, under strictly supervised conditions, of course, as long as SCP-2094's condition continues to show improvement. I've lowered the suicide risk level to RL1 and hope to see it at RLL by the end of the year. As you are aware, high-risk humanoids are a substantial drain on resources, and it is my hope that we will be able to use some of the funding saved on extreme supervision for additional research. It's likely that, over the course of reading this letter, the thought has crossed your mind that SCP-2094 is merely putting on an act to manipulate personnel into complying with its whims. As SCP-2094's primary caretaker for almost the entirety of the past decade, I can safely say that if it is, in fact acting, then we can assume with certainty that SCP-2094 is once again as healthy as it was during its first few years of containment. Eccentric, yes, but healthy. Dr. Miranda Aniston Selected Interview Number 3 Interviewer, Dr. Aniston Interviewee, SCP-2094 Notes The following is an excerpt from an interview recorded on May 16, 2014. Begin log. And he ate the entire thing? Yeah, the entire thing. <laughs> I told him it was my job. And then what did you do? Oh, you know. I just decided to take the high road and give him a couple minutes time out in my gut. You didn't. I did indeed. Boy, Manny was furious. Not as furious as he was after the old noodle incident, of course. But, you know. You're referring to the misadventure that led you to ending up in the trunk, correct? I've wondered about that for a while now. Have you gotten those memories back? Yeah. I still don't have everything, but I've got all that stuff. Kind of wish I could forget it. That's all right. I'm not going to press you about it if you're not ready. <laughs> I know you won't. That's what I'm going to tell you. You really don't have to- Too late. I've made up my mind. Okay, so you know how Manny saved me from my rotten home life? I do. Well, that's how Manny did things for a long time. He helped people. I don't think he had been in charge that long before I joined. The thing is, the longer he was in power, the more he'd change. It was little things at first, you know? Snip your attitude and all that. Folks just chalked it up to the stress of keeping all of his weirdos in order. But then he started bringing in these kids. He always brought in kids, of course, every once in a while, maybe two or three a year. That may sound like a lot of kids, but you gotta remember that the circus of the disquieting isn't just a single show. It's a multifaceted entertainment extravaganza. There's the big top show, of course, but there's also the den of freaks, the menagerie of mayhem, the individual tents for special acts, not to mention all the non-performance jobs. Point is, we've got a plethora of people in all sorts of places, both kids and adults. But at some point or another, Manny started bringing kids in that were different from the ones who'd come before. I should know. I was the one who usually worked with them. Manny gave us the usual stories, broken family, orphans, saved from the streets, stuff like that. But there was something off about them. I figured it was just trauma, or they were overwhelmed by the circus like I had been. But something still didn't feel quite right. I didn't trust my gut, though. I was stupid for a long time. I put on my charm, played around with them, got them to warm to the circus, and forgot about whatever it was that haunted them. That changed with this one kid, though. Little girl. Delicate little thing. Literally. That was her whole shtick. She'd fold up pieces and put herself back together again. I was standing with her one day, trying to teach her how to juggle herself, and all of a sudden she just broke down and started crying, saying she wanted to go home. That's when I knew, deep in my gut, that Manny'd been taking kids. If the man with the upside-down face wants you to keep quiet about something, it's no easy feat to share it. I yelled, I fought, 
I told him that wasn't how we did things anymore. And you know what he did? He slapped me across the face and told me that he was doing what he could to keep the circus alive. Can you believe that? Even with everything we were doing, he still thought the circus was on the verge of collapse. In hindsight, I think he might have just been overly worried. Or maybe still hung up on Fuller's way of doing things. Either way, it's no excuse for what he did. I couldn't stand it. I had to do something. I stashed the girl away in my mouth and snuck her off to the kaleidoscope. She was home before lunch. Manny was waiting for me when I got back. He was livid, of course. He said I'd betrayed him. Betrayed the circus. Betrayed the trust that was put into me when I got teleportation privileges. He made a huge deal out of it. Called everyone together to watch him locking me in the trunk for you guys to find. <laughs> it's kind of funny looking back on it. Now that I know that it practically killed him to do it. He was so scared of losing control. He had to make an example of me. SCP was the big bugaboo around the surface at the time. See, since the big Mickey D scare had blown over. It made sense that he'd use that to his advantage. He had to get me out of the picture. But at least he sent me somewhere safe. Yeesh, look at me talk. You got anything to drink in here? End log. Alright, that's all I have to say about this subject. Out of all the clowns in the circus, there were three I was allowed to be around. Jojo LeBose watched her weight very carefully. She only clocked in at a measly 300 pounds of pure whale blubber, but she did her diligence to maintain the illusion of weighing twice as much. My attempts to engage her in conversation would invariably end in threats of being sat on. Wembley Pinhead wore one of those pointy caps with a puffball on top, which he wore on an oversized prosthetic forehead, which he wore on his real head which he wore on a lurching storm of frills and ruffles so dense that some questioned if there's even a person underneath. He was subtle like that. Avoided me like the plague, but it wasn't personal. The guy hated kids. There was one time he announced that clowning is a mature art form for a mature audience. Many regard this to be his comedic peak. Scruffy McRubbins had the voice, grace, and heart of a chain-smoking grizzly bear, and he was worth more than all the grandmothers I never had. Dressed in drag more often than not. He didn't just talk to me. He talked to me the same way he talked to everyone else. Like a freak. He smelled like home. But not in a weird way. When I first caught wind of the rumors, Scruffy was the person I went to for information. He was wise. For a clown. And the sound of his voice was the conversational equivalent of a good, hard, deep tissue massage. I found him on a stump behind the den of freaks, polishing the beast tamer's wooden leg for chump change. If a man can't catch a fish, he'll despair and want, is what he said when I approached. That's how Scruffy was, you see? He never used a stock greeting. He leapt into the conversation ass over ankles and waited for you to catch up. So as I remember what my old great grandson passed on to me before passing on. You ever been fishing before, Barney? No. It didn't occur to me at the time that the question might have been anything other than the Inquisition of Facts, so I jumped straight into the question of my own. Who is SCP? Scruffy groaned an impressive groan. All those groans were impressive. Every sound that came from his mouth was impressive. Pretty sure his vocal cords were just two rocks grinding together. You don't want to saddle your bean with all that. He told me, taking his attention back to the leg in his lap. I didn't like this answer, so I ignored it. Why is she coming after us? What's the Big Shots doing about it? Does the man know about her? Scruffy continued to polish vigorously. There ain't any essay, Barney. Some people just like telling stories. And some stories ain't worth hearing. You keep that space in your noggin resolved for things that'll keep a smile in your gut and your feet on the clouds. The soy kiss is safe and sound. And don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Sorkis. That man was perfection incarnate. But I didn't want to hear that I was safe. I liked scary stories. I wanted a fright that would drain the blood from my bones. 
Without another word, I turned and left Scruffy to his leg. Gordy Lantern Skull was as much of a showman off the stage as he was on. Every moment rolled off his body with an effortless panache. Every cockney syllable dripped with a wry affection, and he was never, not ever, underdressed. Most times I was too awestruck by his honeysuckle ore to speak to him, but he was my best bet for a good scoop. He was sprawled on the grass, lengths of limbs stretched in repose. Puffs of cigar smoke fluttered out in hypnotic spirals from the flickering caverns where his eyes should have been. Even a lazy evening on the lawn became an art form in Gordy's hands, you see. He waited until I stood right over him before acknowledging my presence. He got! He exclaimed in mock surprise, his eye holes shooting a burst of smoke and fire that came just shy of my face. I laughed and this seemed to please him. It looks like I've been found. What can I do for you, boy? I was clever enough to hold my breath when the smoke hit me, and I was so proud of my cleverness that I almost couldn't remember why I'd been looking for him. What's the story on that Esty woman everyone's whispering about? Ah, I wish you hadn't asked, he said with a skull-wide grin. Gordy rarely needed much prompting to launch into a bit. He reared his legs back and kicked himself upright. So you've heard the murmurings then? Those dark tales and ill omens the circus walk nary day whisper have reached your innocent ears, eh? The dreaded dame, Essevia. Her very name bites at my lips. It's best you cast it from your mind. Don't make me relive that horror, lad. Every word had some corresponding bodily flourish, an expression, a turn of the head. I nodded wordlessly, afraid to break the spell he was weaving. It's against my better judgment to disclose the circuits of the vast ocean of misery looming over us. He continued, not missing a beat. But I suppose it's too late to spare you from the upcoming flood. For you, dear boy, I shall pull back the curtain and lay bare the truth. Thus began the epic of Esther Pleiades Pringlewoot, a young woman who dreamt of molding the world into one where magic and mundane live side by side, where circuses would dissolve as the realm of the fantastic converge with society at large. She wants to tear down the walls that divide us, Bonnie. In her eyes, we are but captives here, imprisoned by the cruel constraints of society. But I'm not a prisoner. I want to be here. I like making people throw up. So do I, dear boy. So do we all. But where you and I see a conglomeration of miracles, Essie sees a bubble of magic to be popped. She will tear us from the circus while claiming to be our liberator, and she will make us live ordinary lives amongst the bland folk. But beware. If you dare raise your voice in defiance, she will ensnare you within a book. A fell tome of her own binding, and seal you away within your own story. Don't rest upon the shelves of her library until Zion calls at the end of days. This bedazzling bullshit went on for some time. He bowed when he was through, and I applauded him. Thanked him for his time, swore on what stone from which my grave be carved, never to share what I'd heard with another living soul, and left. He went back to staring eyelessly at the sky and thinking about the handful of stories that he didn't like to tell. Scythe was the kind of guy who never needed an occasion to wear leather. If you ask me, a person can't be too comfortable in their own skin if they're always wearing someone else's. Despite whatever instability Scythe may have suffered in his romantic ventures, the dude showed unwavering commitment to his aesthetic. Applied eyeliner every morning with religious devotion. Though for what God is anyone's guess. Maybe it was Satan. Maybe it's Maybelline. Once a week I came into his practice tent and he'd pretend to teach me how to juggle. The big shots were adamant that I learn, and everyone else capable of teaching me either had seniority or is banned from interacting with children altogether. So Scythe got stuck with the job. He hated it. Granted, Scythe hated everything and everyone, though I think my reciprocal loathing caused him to respect me somewhat. Albeit in his own stupid way. All right, buttless, he said with exasperation, which was how he said everything. Playtime's over. We're done with the hollow stuff. You're doing real pins today. No complaints. Got it? Bottomless, I corrected him. Barney the bottomless boy. I know. I'm mocking you. He swung his head to flip his hair out of his eyes and hurled a juggling pin in my direction without so much as a think fast. 
It met my fingers and I accepted its weight into my hand, then redirected it back where it came from. Instead of Scythe catching the pen as I expected, he barely even registered it coming towards him before it nailed him square in the chest. Oh, what the hell, kid? He yelled, clutching his ribs. This isn't a two-person act, okay? You're gonna be performing solo, so you're gonna be practicing solo. Jesus. What if we combined our acts? I suggested. I mean, they're already really similar. What if we juggle together pens and knives, and I swallow the pens when you catch the knives in your torso? I was rewarded for my idea with a juggling pin to the head. Not hard, just enough to hurt. I took the pins and started practicing. Well, look at you go, he said, slinking against the tent post. Aren't we the little prodigy? Fuck if I know why they need me to babysit you. I was a natural at juggling. In hindsight, I think that's no small part of why Scythe despised me so much. Everyone keeps yammering on and on about that Essie lady. I said, keeping my eyes on the pens as they danced. There was no way Scythe would tell me about Essie if I asked directly, but if I gave him something to complain about, he'd tell me everything. Nobody even really knows what they're talking about. People here don't got two brain cells to rub together, Scythe replied. I heard one guy say that Essie's in it with that Wondertainment hack. Can you believe that? I mean, how does that make a micro fuck of sense? It's bad enough people think SCP is even a person. She's not a person? I asked, nearly missing a pen. Should've known you'd believe that shit. It's just a government front name. The feds don't like what we're doing, so they're trying to shut us down. It doesn't take a genius to figure that out. Why'd they want to shut down the circ- Scythe snatched a pen out from over my head. I was so thrown off that I completely missed the next one. And I probably would have lost a toenail when it hit my foot if I hadn't already lost that one to Mommy's little bedroom toe jam. It's cause they're afraid of us. He said wielding the pen like a knife over my head. People don't like wild animals when they're not in cages. A lion's only a pussycat until it gets hungry. And kid, the world knows we're starving. These folks have their way, they'll put us down behind the woodshed and suck the goddamn fairy dust from our veins. They just have to find us first. He tossed the pen back to me and I resumed juggling. Scythe so passed the time by trying to see how many knives he could fit into his ribcage. He ran out of knives and got bored, so he left me to practice by myself while he ran some errands up his nose. Asking folks about Essie became something of a pastime of mine. Everyone, and I mean everyone, had a different idea of who or what she was. Jeremiah Puzzlegut said Essie comes from a world that's upside down, and that she'll pull your teeth through your toes to make you her idea of right side up. Laura Jean the Spider Queen explained that SCP is the leader of a group of religious zealots, who considered the circus to be anathema, in the eyes of the great allulating all and evermore. Tiberius Montgomery Shin, who helped with the lights, told me that the SCP Foundation is just a charity that won't stop hounding the circus for donations. Time went on. The stories grew wilder for a while, then they started to die out. Same could be said about the old crow. Scythe turned out to be right about me. I didn't need juggling lessons. Our weekly bonding time didn't last more than a few months. When I was in my early teens, the big shots made my idea if I can bind to act a reality. After a couple years of that, I developed such a unique and complex repertoire that the folks in charge decided Scythe was holding me back. Poor guy ended up strapped to a wheel while I chucked scimitars into his chest. He took it pretty hard. Eventually he quit performing in the big top, then quit altogether. They put him in the den of freaks where visitors paid to impale him. One night, he and his friend Jack Daniels decided it'd be nice to relive his glory days by tossing around some flaming katanas. Do you have any idea what burning leather smells like? Neither do I. I wasn't there. Now that I think about it, he couldn't have been older than 30 when he died. I was too preoccupied with shoving myself on his brother to attend the service, but everyone said it was lovely. <laughs> I'm not sure which half of that sentence he would have hated more. Gordy Landon's call, by contrast, was a performer to the very end. When he died, it happened in front of the largest audience the circus had seen in decades. Everyone loved when Gordy would take a swig of kerosene and spurt ribbons of flame from his various facial orifices. But it was nothing compared to the sight of his famous lantern skull unexpectedly exploding like a butternut squash on a powder keg. Some called the Volcano of Gore a tragic accident. Others said it was the grand finale he'd been planning for years. Either way, I firmly believe he'd be pleased with the spectacle. Jojo LeBeau stubbed her toe and went septic not long after my 21st birthday. Her remains were burnt, as per the ironic stipulation in her will that her body not be used for any funny business. 
Story goes that her flab proved to be more flammable than anticipated, and the furnace went spiraling out of control. Most of Sleeper Row went up in smoke that night. I had dirt for her bed from June to September. Wembley Pinhead hung up his ruffles and left the following year, said he wanted to pursue the dramatic arts. Sometimes folks make a big messy deal out of when people try to leave the circus, but human clowns were basically visual limbs at that point, and Wilford Pembroke ran away to join the real world with no fanfare whatsoever. And Scruffy McGrubbins, the last true clown at the circus, the last human clown at the circus, the clown who held me after I accidentally suffocated my border collie inside my stomach, and challenged me to put out his cigar with my tears, well, I don't know what happened to him. People tell stories, of course. They always do, and they always should. The second most popular theory is that he simply left without a word, and lives his days quietly in a flat down in Kent. The most popular theory is that the other clowns didn't like having someone around them who wasn't one of their own. I never imagined I'd end up finding out firsthand who SCP is. Let alone did I think that she might be as curious about the circus as it was about her. You asked me to describe Herman Fuller's circus of its quieting. Well, I'll tell you what it is, Doctor. It's people.